It's with great pleasure that I welcome Professor Stefan Lewandowski, who will give our hot topic presentation this year, and it couldn't be more topical. Um, Stefan is Chair of Cognitive Psychology at the University of Bristol. His research focuses on computational modelling, trying to understand how the mind works by writing computer simulations of our memory and decision-making processes. Stefan has become interested in how people update their memories if things they believe turn out to be false. This has led him to examine the persistence of misinformation in society and how myths and misinformation can spread. He's become particularly interested in the variables that determine whether or not people accept scientific evidence. For example, um, evidence surrounding vaccinations or climate science. His talk today is the post-truth world, science and vaccinations. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Here we go. Yes, post-truth and vaccinations in the age of COVID. I want to touch on all these uh, issues in my talk today. So for starters, what do I mean by the post-truth world? Well, there has been a lot of talk about this uh, in the media and elsewhere. And one of the symptoms or indicators that keeps coming up is the record of the previous uh, American president, Donald Trump, who in four years in office made, uh, according to fact checkers, more than 30,000 false or misleading claims. Now that's equivalent to 21 per day, which means probably more than one per waking hour. So that is quite an interesting record of misleading or outright false claims. Now, what for me as a cognitive scientist, what's even more interesting in this context is these data, which refer to Donald Trump's approval rating while in office. And basically what you find is that approval was relatively flat, never uh, above 50%, but also not far below it across the entire four years of his presidency. It's only after he lost the election that uh, his approval also fell. Now, more importantly, at no point in his presidency did he have less than 77% of his own party behind him. Now, that is interesting because there appears to be this divergence between the politician being massively dishonest on the one hand, and not losing support on the other. Now, some sociologist colleagues of mine have termed uh, that phenomenon shock and chaos disinformation. And that, they argue, refers to a situation in which politicians lie or mislead or speak falsehoods, but very often with no apparent purpose. Um, and not only do the lies have no apparent purpose at times where you kind of wonder why is he even making this stuff up? It's not in his political interest. Uh, it is accompanied by what I call an altered ontology of truth. That is what happens is, and we can observe this on both sides of the Atlantic, what happens is that um, the very notion of truth is changed. We now have things like alternative facts. We have some of Trump's surrogates saying, oh, truth isn't truth. And over here in the United Kingdom, um, there, there have been some personalities, public personalities saying, you know, well, forget about facts, that's antiquated. And, you know, one man's fact is another man's lie. Now that's incredibly convenient if you can remap truth in such a way because you can ignore all challenges to what you say, either by just relabeling as, as fake news or by saying, oh, well, who knows what's true? You know, and the moment you convince people of that, um, you have basically escaped accountability. Now, I think it's important to understand how we got here and how this is different from what's happened in the past and what the consequences are for uh, the public and for science. Now, how do we get here? Well, 
what's happened is that misinformation, which has always existed in politics, has been transformed to no longer be carefully curated to, to, to contest an agreed reality, such as the weapons of mass destruction or Richard Nixon denying Watergate. We, we no longer do that. The, the politicians are no longer, those politicians at least, are no longer interested in contesting an agreed reality what they have done is to say, oh, well, no one knows what reality is, therefore I can say what I want. Now, that has consequences on people's conceptions of honesty. I've already shown you public opinion data with Donald Trump's support over his uh, presidency, throughout his presidency. Here are some more opinion poll data, and this is just one snapshot of several, where people were asked, Americans were asked, how often does Trump tell the truth? Now, among Democrats, very few Democrats think that he speaks the truth at all. Among Republicans, by a three to one margin, it goes the other way. Republicans think in poll after poll that Donald Trump is honest, notwithstanding his record. And that raises a very interesting psychological question. Why? Is this shock and chaos disinformation accepted? How can people possibly think of Donald Trump as being honest? Well, I think the answer lies in this notion, the authenticity of the lying demagogue, which is actually the title in the title of that paper I'll tell you about now. And when you examine what Donald Trump and other populist politicians like him are doing, they are often stating falsehoods about public events that can be easily disproven. I mean, there's just no question about, you know, there's nothing gray here. They're, they're just saying stuff that's plain false. Now, that has a signaling function because if I lie so blatantly, then what I'm basically doing is to say, oh, well, I don't care about honesty. I'm violating this establishment norm of honesty. I'm thereby signaling contempt for that elite or establishment. And in so doing, I'm signaling that I'm an authentic champion of the real people, which within a populist logic of politics are the pure real people that are opposing the corrupt elite. Now, this can be shown in experiments and the paper by Hall and colleagues did that very elegantly. It turns out that when people question the legitimacy of a system because they're left out or because they feel threatened in their status of power, then any norm violation by a political candidate signals authenticity. So if I'm not telling the truth, then I'm violating an elite or establishment norm, thereby signaling I'm on the side of the people. If I say education and science is bad for you, I'm doing the same thing. I'm signaling my championship for the uh, authentic, you know, pure people that are not as corrupt as the elite. And this effect can be induced in experiments. And we can turn it on and off based on whether or not people question the legitimacy of the political system they're in operating within. Now, what is very interesting is that people not only become accepting of lying demagogues in those situations, they also themselves begin to engage in that signaling discourse where accuracy is no longer a, a currency with high value. Now, what I'm showing you here, these two photos are experimental stimuli from a behavioral experiment that was done a few days after Donald Trump's inauguration in 2016. The photo on the left shows Donald Trump's inauguration, the one on the right, uh, Barack Obama's. There's absolutely no question that, you know, that a lot fewer people attended Donald Trump's inauguration than Obama's. 
which Donald Trump denied and his surrogates uh, uh, were proclaiming at the time, oh no, it's the largest crowd ever that attended an inauguration and notwithstanding the photographic evidence and all sorts of other evidence uh, to the contrary. Now, in this experiment, people were asked to click the picture that has more people in it. I mean, it's not a very complicated experimental task and you can't really get it wrong. And if you look at the data and you break it down by who people voted for, then indeed you find, well, people who didn't vote or who voted for Clinton never got it wrong. I mean, the, those errors are due to a coffee spilling on the keyboard or some random event. These are not systematic errors if they're that low. But now look at Trump voters. Among Trump voters, a larger share of people picked the wrong picture. In fact, highly educated Trump voters, a quarter of them picked the picture. Greater education led to more errors. Well, except were they actual errors or were they responses that expressed people's political views and the highly educated Trump voters were able to recognize the picture, link it to the controversy, and then say to themselves, you know what, I bet you that experimenter is an academic and a liberal, well, I'm going to tell him what I really think. And so they picked the wrong photo, you know, and they're doing this to signal uh, their allegiance to their leader, thereby engaging in what some people call participatory propaganda. Um, and from that, you develop this uh, bubble, or whatever you want to call it, where the acceptance of lying demagogues has flow on consequences that are very relevant to us as a scientific community. So what I'm showing you here are more public opinion data from the United States, um, asking American adults to say whether universities have a negative or positive effect on the country, right? Now, among Democrats, by, by a vast margin, you know, three to one, almost four to one, uh, Democrats say, yeah, well, universities and colleges are positive for the country overall. And they've been saying this for the last 20, 30 years, what I'm showing you here, just the last eight, but, you know, totally <laughs> they're in favor of education. Now, if you turn to Republicans, then until around 2015, they too thought higher education was good for the country, but not by as much, but nonetheless, a clear majority, more than 50% of Republicans thought, hey, universities are kind of cool, you know, they're good for the country. And then watch what happened. After 2016, once Trump took over, bang, it flipped around and all of a sudden, Republicans thought, whoa, <laughs> universities are bad for the country by a two to one split. Education is bad. Now, nothing between 2015 and 2017 happened within universities that could explain that. Universities didn't change that drastically in two years. What did change was the Republican leadership. And we had a lying demagogue in power who violated establishment norms out of principle as a feature, not as a bug, as a feature to signal that he was on the side of, of the people against the elites. And the elites, of course, include, in this case, universities. Bang, you see that here. So shock and chaos, disinformation, the populist climate in which it takes place is accompanied by flow-on consequences. These are not neutral events we can ignore. And here are some very clear hints uh, for that across a number of domains. Climate change, well, guess what? Donald Trump thought global warming was created by the Chinese. Okay, he tweeted that out. He tweeted dozens, if not a hundred of tweets um, saying that climate change is a hoax. Populism is also related to the endorsement of conspiracy theories about COVID-19. These are, again, American data where we find that being Republican translates into significantly greater endorsement. Those are the points to the right of that vertical red line 
significantly greater endorsement of various conspiracy theories about COVID, namely that it was a biological weapon created by the Chinese. Well, if you're a Republican, you're more likely to believe that than if you're independent or a Democrat. Um, and turning to Europe and looking at vaccination hesitancy, there is this striking relationship uh, between the share of votes for populist parties in a country and hesitancy. The more people vote populist, the more hesitancy they express on uh, surveys about vaccinations. Very strong relationship. Now, let me tell you about a couple of experiment, my uh, experiment studies that my colleagues and I have done over the years that examines this relationship between worldviews, political attitudes, and vaccination attitudes at the level of um, individuals. Um, I'm going to tell you about three studies. They're all very similar. They're large, uh, about a thousand people in each. They're American representative samples. And um, what we attempted to do in all of these studies is to take a whole bunch of political uh, constructs as potential predictors of attitudes towards vaccinations. And so we have these vaccination items that we have used in a number of uh, studies, basically you know, expressing support or hesitancy. Uh, the polarity of items went both ways. People either agreed with them or not. Um, and then what we find is a fairly clear pattern. There is a significant, modestly sized correlation between various predictors of political conservatism or libertarianism or populism. It doesn't really matter in this case what you measure and how you measure it, that are always negatively correlated with people's acceptance of vaccinations. Uh, and the correlations are, as I said, modest, but they're always there. The more libertarian people are, the less likely they are to endorse vaccinations. The more conservative they are, they sometimes reduce endorsement. And it goes on. There are other constructs we can use. You get the same result. Here is a summary of precisely that effect. Um, across 24 different countries, published by Matt Hornsey and colleagues a couple of years ago. And you see precisely the same relationship pretty much in every country, but also above all, when you average or aggregate across the countries. The more, in this instance, people are hierarchical, that is, the more, you know, right wing, um, the more hesitant they are of vaccinations. Now, this isn't just a theoretical exercise or something of interest to political psychologists. This translates into action. And here's the translation. These are um, the share of actual vaccinations uh, being administered across different US states expressed as a function of who they voted for. On the left, we have votes for Biden on the left, for Trump on the right, uh, undecided or close states in the middle are in gray. And what you can see is that the more people voted for Trump in each US state, the more hesitant they are of um, COVID-19 vaccinations. And that translates into their behavior because the more a state voted for Trump, the fewer people in it have received a vaccination. And it is a dramatic difference. I mean, we're talking about, you know, between 30 and 50%. That, that, that's a big spread. That's a lot of people who are not protected in states who predominantly voted for Trump. So these things matter. And they matter not only to explain what's going on, but they also matter because we can, in a sense, exploit these worldviews uh, in our efforts to communicate with people. Now, here's an experiment run by Dan Cahan some time ago about the HPV vaccine, which I love because uh, he created these four non-existent people. I have no idea who these people are. They're just random photos taken from Google probably. 
But look at what they are purported to have written in terms of the, the authors of, of books. Now, the people we're most interested in is, is the dude over here in the top left and the, the, the guy down here on the bottom right. I'm, I'm tempted to call him a hippie based on not just his looks, but also uh, the, uh, the title of the books he's purportedly written. You know, Three Social Evils, Sexism, Racism, and Homophobia. This guy up here, by contrast, wrote a book called The Immigrant Invasion threatening the American way of life. I think you can get a very clear sense of, of the caricature of who these people are. Now, we can do the same thing with a questionnaire with participants. We can identify on the basis of a questionnaire which of these quadrants people belong to. And then what we can do, and what Dan did in that experiment, is to present pro and anti HPV vaccine information to people of these different worldviews in these two different clusters, the, the hippies and the free marketeers or whatever you want to call them. And the messenger was either aligned as you would expect, namely the free marketeer was anti-vax, the hippie was pro-vax, um, or you flipped it around. So that the messenger was, was saying stuff that was unexpected. Uh, in other words, the free marketeer would endorse the vaccine, even though HPV vaccines have a very, um, they come with a lot of baggage, moral baggage, because allegedly it might induce women to be, young women to be promiscuous, because HPV is a sexually transmitted disease. So, so you flip it around, and the conservative guy all of a sudden says, hey, it's a good thing, protect your daughters, uh, versus saying the expected thing, oh, no, 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 it's just making them more sexually active. And you get a dramatic difference in the extent of polarization between these two uh, groups of people. It's a complicated experiment. It's not terribly easy to explain. But look at the two bold-faced numbers. If the messengers are talking to their own tribes in the expected way, you get a lot of polarization of opinion about the vaccine between these two different tribes, because we're really talking about cultural tribes here. It's very tribal. If you flip the messengers around, polarization is reduced, uh, meaning that you can pull people apart or together based on culturally appropriate messaging. And if you have a culturally appropriate messenger, somebody who speaks to people based on who they are, then you can be very effective in swaying their attitudes. Now, let me turn to um, COVID for the last uh, just under 10 minutes or so. Uh, we all know there's been an infodemic, the WHO told us that, yes, indeed, the pandemic has given rise, rise to a lot of um, conspiracy theories, which to an expert is not at all surprising because um, ever since the 14th century and the the plague and, and, and then cholera epidemics, it's always been the case that any pandemic will give rise to conspiracy theories. Nothing surprising. Uh, in fact, as recently as 2021, people attacked the hospital in Holland in their you know, expression of frustration over, over COVID. And in the UK, at least, you know, up to at least 10% of people actually think that COVID-19 is a Chinese bioweapon, similar to the data I showed already for the United States. So that's out there. It has consequences that are concerning because greater endorsement of COVID conspiracy is linked to less adherence to social distancing and less willingness to take the vaccine. And in the case of that 5G conspiracy theory we had going around about a year ago, it's associated with the endorsement and performance of actual violence, namely attacking uh, 5G installations as happened in the UK about a year ago. So these conspiracy theories are concerning. And uh, as it turns out, just by coincidence, right before the pandemic, uh, a colleague of mine and I published this handbook, which is now been translated into eight languages, 
um, that tells you how to combat conspiracy theories. And because it's a public facing document, I just pop the link to this one and another two I'll talk about in a minute into the chat. So if you're interested, that's a practitioner's guide to how to deal with um, conspiracy theories. Now, it turns out misinformation affects people in an adverse manner, even if, if it's not wrapped up in a conspiracy theory. So uh, there's evidence to suggest that exposure to misinformation um, reduces people's willingness to get vaccinated by a considerable amount, if you do that in an experiment. In real life, watching Fox News in the US causes people to reduce compliance with social distancing compared to other news stations that were not as uh, misinforming about the COVID pandemic as Fox News had been throughout. And yes, we wrote another handbook. This came out last October. We actually worked on it during the pandemic that summarizes what to do about misinformation and how to uh, combat it. Now, I can't summarize the handbook in my remaining five minutes or so, um, but there are two things I can say. Number one, misinformation sticks. And this is what makes it pernicious. If people are exposed to nonsense, such as the Pope endorses Donald Trump, then even if they're exposed to a correction, and even if they believe the correction, this is the critical thing. Even people who believe the correction and hence know that it was fake news they were exposed to, even then people act as if they still rely on the misinformation. Why? Well, because it is very difficult to update a situational model in your mind and to have a key piece of information ripped out of it without filling that with something else. It is simply difficult cognitively to say, oh, well, you know, half the stuff I know is wrong. Well, what do I do with that if I'm then asked to act on the world? Uh, what people do is to continue to rely on the misinformation. Unless, <laughs> And this is one of our countermeasures, unless people are inoculated against it. What does that mean? Well, inoculation is a cognitive technique that works just like a medical vaccination. What happens is that you're warning people that they might be misled. You then expose them to a weakened dose of that misleading information by refuting an anticipated argument and exposing the fallacy of those uh, arguments. Now, this requires knowledge ahead of time of not exactly what people will be exposed to, but how they will be misled. So we have to understand how misleading people mislead. And as it happens, we do. This is an experiment by colleagues from Cambridge that's about to come out where they inoculated participants against COVID-19 misinformation by using these infographics that were published by the European Com Commission and uh, UNICEF and that are actually based on our conspiracy theory handbook and that are kind of cool, you know, oh, th these are the th six things that conspiracy theories have in common, you know, uh, okay, well, don't be misled by that, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what are the red flags for conspiracy theories and so on. In the experimental condition, participants were exposed to that ahead of being tested with misinformation. In a control condition, they just did some random other thing. So uh, the crucial question was, can we inoculate people against being misled? And the answer is yes. And that's been shown over and over again, not just in COVID, it's, it's all over the place and it tends to work extremely well. If you then expose people to tweets such as this one shown here, that's completely manipulative. You know, I mean, wow, the mRNA vaccine is gonna alter your DNA. Uh, you're gonna start glowing in the dark. Um, people can pick that much better after the inoculation than in the control condition. Inoculation works and the effect is even stronger if you can get people involved for 10 minutes into playing this game that teaches them how to avoid misinformation. Now we've done this dozens of times, lots of different populations, and it tends to work really well. 
all of this with specific reference to um, COVID-19 is summarized in the third uh, handbook that we published early this year with an international team, totally interdisciplinary. You know, we had some microbiologists and pediatricians on the team that summarizes what to do uh, specifically with vaccination, specifically about COVID-19. That's now also available in uh, another seven languages, including Japanese and Serbian, which came online yesterday. So if you're interested in a hands-on uh, practitioner of communication, there's a whole bunch of guides that uh, are out there. Which brings me to my last slide of my conclusions. Well, to understand what's happening, we have to understand that we live in a world in which some politicians have used dishonesty as a feature rather than a bug. It is part of populist logic to violate establishment norms. And the easiest way to do that is just to lie. And if you can sell that to people, then we as scientists have a problem. Now, we can deal with that problem by recognizing how important worldviews are and how we can communicate to people uh, through messengers and content that matches their worldview. Now, aside from that, misinformation and conspiracy theories do measurable harm and they're causally related to people's uh, uh, attitudes and behaviors. We, there's now increasing evidence of that. Fortunately, we do have some tools to deal with that. Lots of them, actually. The only one I had time to talk about was inoculation, but that works really well. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Stephen, thank you very much. Um, fascinating topic, a really important topic uh, for all scientists. Hopefully everyone would agree. Um, a, a really interesting insight into the mentality of people and the different <laughs> mentalities of different people. Um, look, we have loads of questions already. Um, if anybody does have a question, please put it into the Q&A and um, upvote any questions you particularly want to get an answer to. Um, so I'll start off with Alison, Alison McFadden. Um, uh, she asks, Stephen, if we have people telling obvious lies to show they are fighting the establishment, how can we tackle that? How can we convince those who do not trust us that the lie is a lie, especially when we have uh, evidence that is still ignored? Yes, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Okay, well, there, there, there are two answers. The, the first answer is at a very political, abstract, long-term level. Lying to people to sell yourself as a champion of the people only works under certain circumstances. It only works when people feel left out and left behind, or when people who are in power feel threatened uh, from, by other people. So that is why fascism, by the way, always is, is a linking up of the left behinds and the elite who feel threatened by some outgroup, immigrants, for example, or women. Uh, so we have to understand that. That means that if by some miracle we can create policies that make it less likely for people to feel left out, that that will make a difference because then populism loses its attractiveness. We know that. Uh, it just doesn't, you know, it's a shallow ideology. It's nonsense. It only works if, if people are sufficiently desperate to think that this, this could be a good idea. Now, that's a, that's a nice scientific answer. It's also very useless because, you know, we're trapped in a world where those policies are not happening at the moment. Um, and of course, the populists themselves are preventing them from being established. So that, but, but we have to know that nonetheless, because we have to work uh, towards that. Mm -hmm. The second thing you can do is you can, um, well, you can, you can have, you can try the culturally appropriate messengers. I mean, populists, <laughs> If, if you can find a populist who, who is not anti-vax, that would be extremely helpful. Now, Donald Trump, to his credit, has said recently, hey, the vaccines are important. You got to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, he did tweet on that while he was still allowed to tweet, or he did say, I don't know, I can't remember the details, but he did that. Whether that had an effect, well, the data uh, suggests otherwise. 
the the other thing of course uh you can do is 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 to you know if people if you have enough time for an engagement is to explain to people that actually you know evidence matters and and um uh if, if you don't listen to the evidence you may be in trouble now it turns out that notwithstanding what i said about populism and all that if you look at the data about trust in scientists we as a community enjoy a lot of trust and and interestingly that trust has gone up uh considerably during the pandemic there are data from the uk that's uh, there about a year ago now or may or june last year where two-thirds of respondents said they trust experts now more than they did before the pandemic there are similar data from germany that showed a tripling of trust in scientists between previous years and 2020 so what is really happening and i didn't have time to get into this is a bifurcation where a small but significant segment of the population goes off into conspiracy theories, but a much larger share of people is actually now more receptive to, to messages. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, on that, there's a really kind of pertinent question here from Leighton Pritchard, um, uh, which I think is, is an, an interesting idea. Some say people cannot be reasoned out of a belief um, that they have not been reasoned into? If so, should we be focusing more on educating children for the next pandemic more than convincing adults? Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, education is never wrong, right? I mean, so yeah, let's do that. Why not? It, it can't hurt. I, I, I've, unlike Republicans, I, I do believe that education is good for the country and, and, and good for people. Um, now, in terms of saying people can't be reasoned out of a belief they've not, well, Yes, that's true if people hold the belief very strongly. And this is, again, important to understand the bifurcation between, you know, let's say 10% of the public in the UK. By the way, that number is comes with error bars. I'm not betting on that being exactly 10. But some share people who, who think that, you know, um, masks are just an instrument of control and COVID is a hoax, and it's also a Chinese bioweapon at the same time. You know, we have those people, hardcore, committed believers in conspiracy theories. And then we have a huge number of other people who are not actually like that. Well, you can talk to the large number of others, the majority of people, quite sensibly, and they're quite sensitive to corrections, as we have shown um, in experiments. Now, it is also true that uh, when you look at the data of vaccine uptake, that a lot of people express hesitancy uh, on their way in and out of the doctor's office to get their shot. So not all of these expressions translate into uh, refusal to, to take the vaccine. This is particularly interesting in Europe, to my mind, where the expressed hesitancy, like in France and Italy, is, is, is sky high. Uh, and, and people will say they're extremely hesitant, but in actual fact, they're, they're now vaccinating, you know, uh, France is, both France and Germany are now vaccinating faster than the UK at the moment, you know, 600,000 people a day or, or thereabouts, depends. Um, and, and the hesitancy doesn't actually, you know, doesn't seem to translate in, into action. And we've observed this, this over and over again. The other thing we've observed is that whenever a new vaccine comes along, there's initially a lot of hesitancy and then it reduces over time. And it's very uh, um, remarkable how well calibrated people are. There, there's data from the United Kingdom about people being very hesitant of the Moderna vaccine in January. No one wanted it. You know, people were happy with AstraZeneca and Pfizer, not Moderna. Why? Well, because they'd never heard of it. They didn't know what it was. Now that Moderna has been started to be used in the UK, confidence in the vaccine goes up. Um, so I, I think a lot of the, the attitudes are important and they do translate into behavior, but equally you can encourage behavior without having to change the attitudes. And, and briefly, see, uh, we have loads of questions. Just on that point about children, is it, is it easier to change children's minds or to convince children and, and almost get them to feed through into the adults? Well, 
Yes, I mean, you know, kids are, are sponges that, that soak up information. And uh, certainly, um, I mean, the, the, the experience, I'm Australian, and so I have experience with the Australian education system and my kids went through it. And, and the stuff they learn about uh, protective, health protective behavior relating to sunscreen, that's a very important thing in Australia, you know. Uh, slip, slap, slop, you know, slap on the sunscreen, slip on the shirt and go on a, something with a hat. Um, they learn that and they do it. And, and they, they would hold me accountable when I neglected to wear a hat uh, in the sun. So yes, I think, I think that works, but it's a long-term project. Yeah. And of course, with vaccines, don't forget, it's all very politicized and uh, unlike sunscreen. You know, I don't know anybody in Australia, even it doesn't matter what politics you have, you don't like being sunburned. Um, with vaccines, it's a little different, and, and I think it might be a bit more tricky yeah. to, to find a curriculum that's accepted by yeah. people I identify. Brilliant. Okay, a question from Steve Griffin. Uh, fantastic talk, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, you've discussed politicians and media. What do you think motivates certain scientists with? Uh, with otherwise respected track records to minimize the pandemic and associate with ever increasingly fringe groups exactly yes. on social media? Great question. And I know exactly who you're talking about. And they're everywhere. They're in tobacco, they're in climate change, they're, they're in COVID. Um, yes. Well, to be brutally honest, there are, two, there are three things, notoriety, money, and ideology. It's going to be one of the three or all three combined. Guarantee you. Absolutely guarantee you. There's, there's nothing else. <laughs> and usually, usually the people who take on these contrarian roles, certainly from climate change, I know that for sure, had a very mediocre career. And no one put a microphone in their face while they were publishing the occasional paper. The moment they became climate deniers, they were on TV all the time. So uh, I think there, 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 is, there is that. There is the reward of notoriety. <sighs> ideology and and surprisingly often money don't underestimate money it's there and and you can trace it if you look hard enough i've got a chapter in in, in the works about the link between climate denial and COVID denial it's the same people the same think tanks they're spending the same amount of money on that okay. so that's where it's coming from that's worrying. Okay, next one uh, from Marek Slomka. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. Last Saturday's anti-vax, yeah. anti-lockdown, anti-mask protests in London involved a curious mix, mix of leftists and rightist libertarians. Uh, these messages seem to cut across current political boundaries. Any thoughts or observations? Yes, that you're. Abs I mean, absolutely. Um, now, <laughs> yeah, just looking at who's there. It's. Well, there is there's something called the horseshoe theory of politics, which is that as you move away from the center to the extremes, you're bending around and they become very close again. And certainly in the United Kingdom, that's been my observation from day one. I found it absolutely fascinating how you, you can't tell apart the left wing cranks and, and the right wing cranks. I mean, they, they seem to be cranky. I mean, have that in common. Let's be honest about it. So, so yeah, that um, doesn't entirely surprise me. There's evidence to suggest that that uh, endorsement of conspiracy theories tends to be associated, well, tends to be greater at the political extremes. There's data on that. However, uh, there's also a slant in this whole thing, and that is that in, in in if you look at the distribution and the number of these people, they're far more on the right than on the left. Now, I think the reason is because there are far more people on the right than on the left. Uh, the, the share may be the same, but so it's lopsided towards the right, the populist right. There's plenty of data on that. But yeah, that doesn't mean that that if you're on the extremes, it, it, it no longer matters whether you're on the left or the right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fascinating how it's yeah, it's such a mixture, isn't it? Look, there's so many questions, folks. I'm not going to get to them all. So I've just been scanning down through, and I'm going to pick out one that I think is um, very relevant to all of us, and it's from Gemma Franklin. Um, Stephen, what do you think we as scientists could or could do in order to counter uh, misinformation? Well, uh, first of all, start with the handbooks. I popped the link in the chat. They, they have a lot of, you know, if you want hands-on recommendations, they're full of them. And they're not that long. They're like 10 or 12 pages each. Um, so that's one answer for the 
recipes, practical recipes about how to go about it. Now, I personally think that as scientists, we have a responsibility to speak out and to engage um, with the public in, in any means possible, which is, you know, I mean, you can do that on Twitter, you can do it uh, on TV and op-eds on the radio. I mean, at the moment, I can assure you, there's no lack of demand uh, by the media for information about COVID vaccinations. I mean, I, I get calls every day and so do some of my colleagues, Adam Finn from the University of Bristol, who's one of the co-authors of the handbook. I mean, he, he can't help himself. He's buried under media requests uh, and, and op-eds and all that. So the more you can help with that, the better. I think uh, that that's my recommendation, using the tools in the handbooks. But see, I mean, it, like, and, and in relation to a question from Jamie Hall as well, like, this idea of changing people's minds, I mean, you talk there about right at the beginning that that facts and honesty and things almost don't mean anything to an extent anymore if people have made up their minds. You know, is it realistic to think that we can change people's minds just by bombarding them with the facts or, do, you know, oh. is there, do we need to switch it around somehow? I'm not saying bombarding with facts. No, that's different. Uh, what I'm saying is we have certain tools. Now, those tools aren't just spewing out facts. They, they are things like inoculation, where you're not spewing out facts, but you're explaining how conspiracy theorists mislead. That's very different from factual knowledge. I mean, it is sort of, well, no, it's not facts. It's, it's a skill. Uh, and likewise, with debunking, there are certain ways in which we should debunk misinformation. It's spelled out in one of the handbooks. And again, it's not just pouring out facts. There's more to it than that. Absolutely. Now, can I just add one comment? I just, yeah. a question caught my attention sure. in the, the Q&A, is that all right, by Steve yeah. Oliver, uh, about the causation correlation issue. Is it that people are more likely to watch, you know, whatever, that, that yeah. Fox News yeah. doesn't actually cause it? It's a very interesting question. Of course, crucial question. But we can now begin to answer that. And the answer is, it's actually causal. How do we know that? Well, super clever stuff. It turns out that um, if a TV station in the United States is higher up in the list of cable channels, higher up on your remote control, it gets an extra boost in viewership that's independent of everything else. It's like voting ballots where people vote more for the person on top. That buys you 2% in your, in your seat, by the way, being on top of the ballot. Um, so you can use that as an instrumental variable to identify causality because it turns out that, you know, if Fox is higher up in the list, more people watch it and so more people die from COVID. And, and because that is random, the assignment of channels to position, you can use that to infer causality and, and it seems to be cause. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. That's, yeah, it is amazing. Um, I suppose we're lucky to have the BBC. Well, <laughs> not sure everyone would agree, but. Um, okay, look, we could talk all day about this, and and the response has been absolutely fantastic in terms of Q and A's and and attendees. But unfortunately, we do have to call it uh, call a stop to it. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, really you. fascinating topic. I'm sure everyone will tune into those handbooks as well. So thanks for sharing those, um, folks. Thanks a million for attending. Thank you to all the questions. It makes my life a lot easier. Um, I've been told to remind everyone that the recording of this session will be available on the virtual event platform from the 5th of May. Um, and to remind everyone that, of course, starting at 10 o'clock, there are three parallel sessions. Um, so just go back to the main platform site and you'll get access to those. Again, Stephen, thank you very much. And thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good pleasure. Have a Bye. Nice